Say the word bear and an image automatically comes to mind. Dangerous, bold, unpredictable. In short, something like a grizzly. But the American black bear is a paradox. Smaller than the grizzly, it can be appealing, gentle, even shy. Until recently, it has remained something of a mystery. Biologist Lynn Rogers has dedicated more than 20 years of his life to understanding these elusive and versatile creatures. In the wilderness of Minnesota's northern woods, he has tracked them and observed them in all seasons and in every kind of weather. His persistence has paid off. It has earned him the acceptance and trust of black bears living in the wild and the chance to understand them at last. In summer forests across America, from Florida to Alaska, black bear cubs are busy. They're learning to master all the elements in their world, to be at home in trees, water, and underground dens. They're learning the cycles of budding leaves, hatching insects, and ripening fruits. As adults, their knowledge of the forest will be legendary, their lives finely tuned to the rhythms of the year. These tiny bears will grow up to be powerful creatures and powerful symbols of fertility and rebirth. The proof of their powers comes in winter. the frozen expanse of Superior National Forest, three million acres of Minnesota's woods and lakes. The winters of these northern forests have shaped the black bear's life, and it's here that scientists search out the miraculous secrets of its survival. Dr. Lynn Rogers and his assistant Greg Wilker track a radio-collared bear to its winter den. Rogers, a wildlife biologist with the U.S. Forest Service, studies every aspect of the black bear's life. Its ability to hibernate, to suspend almost all activity for months at a time, remains a biological marvel. Black bears are so much like us for half the year. In the summer, they eat basically the same foods as we do. They have almost the same biochemistry. Yet when winter comes and the food runs out, they cut their metabolic rate in half and enter a state we could never survive. For six or seven months, they go without food or water. They don't urinate or defecate. They barely move. But they emerge completely healthy. And most amazing of all, in the middle of this suspended state, they even managed to give birth. I still don't know how they do it. Inspecting the den, Rogers and Wilker find two new cubs. They were born in mid-January, almost hairless and weighing a mere half pound. Even now, two months later, they are tiny and vulnerable. Their mother is still in the torpor of hibernation, tending the alert little cubs in her biochemical sleep. As winter wears on, the cubs will stay warm and well-fed, securely cradled in the curve of their mother's body.
It's April. Warming temperatures and melting snow could bring the bears out of their dens any day now. For years, Lynn Rogers has tried to observe this carefully guarded moment. Each day, he and Greg Wilker set out for the den. They're in luck. A small furry head is just poking out of the den. I think this will be the first time that I get to see a bear actually come out of his den in the spring. Really, the first time? Yeah. I've tried to see this many times, but always the wrong day. But with all the melting today, I think that it's getting too wet in her den and she has to come out. Slowly and carefully, the mother introduces her babies to the world. Big mother bears that people are so afraid of are so gentle with their cubs. Her movements are still sluggish from her seven months of hibernation. She's lost a third of her body weight, but she won't regain her appetite immediately. It will take several weeks for the effects of hibernation to wear off completely. The cubs can barely walk and could not keep up if their mother went off to forage right away. Later, when she's more awake, she'll move them to a more protected spot until the cubs and her hunger grow stronger. This bear is an experienced mother. She's 26 years old, a very advanced age for a bear. And remarkably, she's still able to give birth. Rogers and Wilker set off to visit the den of another very special black bear, one Rogers has known since she was a cub. He has spent hundreds of hours cultivating her trust. She's now four years old and has just had her first litter. Her name is Terry, and she's already emerged from the den. Her three cubs complain loudly about being left alone. Meltwater has flooded their den, and she must move them one at a time to a new home. As she tends to the first cub, the other two shiver in the cold and cry desperately. She places the cub in her mouth very carefully behind her canine teeth and carries it to the base of a tree. When the cubs can climb, they'll use this tree to escape from predators.
After depositing the first cub, Terry goes back for the second. But cub number one, now alone by the tree, begins to bawl. She returns to check on it, and with the others calling for it too, she sits a moment in understandable confusion. Finally, she retrieves the second cub, gently rolling it down to the tree. Cub number three has run out of patience and makes the trip on its own little legs. The family is reunited, the crying is over, and peace returns to the forest. Rogers returns several days later to see how Terry and the cubs are doing. These first few weeks outside the den are the most dangerous for the little cubs. They can easily die from exposure, for just like human babies, they can't keep themselves warm. The cubs are nursing, and Rogers observes how Terry holds them. See how she's laying on her back in the snow to protect the cubs in her belly? keeping them warm like that. She's putting herself against the cold snow to keep the cubs warm in her belly away from it. And Terry must protect them from more than the cold. Here in Minnesota, cubs can also be killed by wolves, lynx, bobcats, and even other black bears. Although the days pass quickly, winter lingers for a few more weeks. On warmer days, an inquisitive cub may try a bit of exploring. But he doesn't get far in the cold, wet snow before calling for help. <coughs> Terry responds immediately and brings him back to the safety of dry ground.
At last, the winter ice thins and begins to break under the pressure of rushing meltwaters. spring and the northern woods come alive. Other animals give birth now and there are new fawns in the forest. Tender grasses and new leaves help Terry recover from hibernation. But something has happened to one of her cubs. Despite all her care, now only two little bears play beside her. Deer graze peacefully on the June grasses. The adults are too swift and too strong to be caught by bears. Fawns, however, in their first few weeks of life are easy prey. When not with their mothers, they rely on their spotted coats and lack of odor for camouflage. Terry calls her cubs down from the branches and detects something interesting in the bushes. A late fawn too young to follow its mother, lies hidden in the leaves. The fawn remains quite still, but its instinctive attempt to go unnoticed fails. <laughs> The fawn provides both meat and fat, critical additions to Terry's spring diet. The cubs imitate their mother. They're just beginning to eat solid food. After consuming part of the carcass, Terry hides it with a covering of earth and leaves. It will serve as a precious reserve of protein, especially scarce this time of year. Thousands of lakes sparkle across Superior National Forest. At its core is the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. And wherever the bears go in this roadless wilderness, Lynn Rogers and Greg Wilker follow.
Bears are good swimmers and water is no obstacle, but this is tough country for them all the same. It's beautiful, but not generous, and winter comes early. For Rogers, however, this harsh environment is a perfect place to study bears, because where bears live close to the edge, it's easier to tell what's essential for their survival. Doesn't that fire feel good after getting our feet wet today? Sure does. This reminds me of many years ago when I had my first encounter with a black bear. I was uh, sleeping out like this and uh, just sleeping, I was asleep. I heard this thing come over to me and it sniffed me, started with my head and went right down to my toes, sniffing every inch of me. And I thought, I wonder if that's a bear. But I didn't want to open my eyes and I had to kind of the uh, sleeping bag over my face anyway. And it went around me, went to where I had some garbage stored, and didn't pay any attention to me. Sleeping out with bears has become routine for Rogers, another part of getting to know them. But it didn't start out that way 24 years ago. Back then, Rogers was using more traditional techniques. The first step in getting close to a bear was to catch one. A barrel trap rigged with bait. And the nice thing about barrel traps is that when a bear is in there, it's easy to tranquilize the bear. So with a bear caught in a barrel trap, it was very easy to put a radio collar on the bear, check the signal from the radio collar, and let the bear go. But the trouble is, is that the bear's hearing and sense of smell, and even their eyesight, is, is uh, so good. And our way of walking is so clumsy that I just never seem to be able to get close enough to the bear to tell what it's doing. can get to a bed after the bear has left it and from the heat in the bed can get some idea of how long ago that the bear left usually just as I approached I can find where the bear is feeding and collect droppings there So for 18 years, uh, I got bits and pieces of, of uh, what the bears were doing in the forest, but not enough to really know the, the complete story of how bears lived in the forest. Rogers knew he needed to do more to somehow get close to the bears for extended periods of time. This carried certain risks. He realized that on rare occasions, black bears had killed people. After I'd seen bears uh, lunge at me and slap the ground, slap a tree, I did realize that uh, a bear had never followed through. He was just trying to t uh, tell me to stay back. But instead of staying back, he began to follow the bears, 
slowly moving closer and closer as they got used to him. By interpreting their charges in terms of their fear instead of his, Rogers began to get a sense of what good bear manners are and how he should behave around them. At last, he could fill in the missing pieces, adding to the information from radio-collared bears his close, personal observations. That was a major turning point in my research. After 18 years of trying other things, I finally realized I can be accepted by bears. <laughs> As summer unfolds, a beautiful cinnamon-coated black bear brings her family to graze in a meadow. This common color variation leads some to mistake them for grizzlies, but there are no grizzlies in Minnesota. It's just an example of the black bear's versatility. This is the second summer for these cubs. They're just about ready to fend for themselves. It's time for their mother to mate again and to leave them on their own for good. They'll soon separate as litter mates and each will stake out its own little zone within its mother's territory. Their mother shoulders the burden of extending her range to make room for them. By passing on some of her established territory, she helps ensure the cub's survival for another year. The young male will need to find a future mating range and will leave the territory when he's two or three. He takes up the difficult life of a nomad, kept on the run by other bears, traveling perhaps a hundred miles to find his own range. The females will remain close to where they were born. When they're ready to mate, the males will come to them. But these youngsters still have a lot of growing up to do and are quick to scamper to the safety of the branches the moment they feel threatened. The next day, their mother is alone in the early morning rain. One chapter in her maternal life has just ended, and another is about to begin. A male has been drawn by her scent and now deposits his own. He uses the tree as a signpost to advertise his presence. The female isn't ready to receive him yet and retreats to the privacy of a small pond. The male finds he's not alone and must turn his attention to a rival. The males will compete for her briefly but fiercely and then move on to find another female. She too will mate with several males 
and the cubs in her next litter may have different fathers. The males have moved closer to her and begin to threaten each other in earnest. There is a winner, and the female now begins to find him interesting. They bite and cuff each other in courtship, playing together for hours or even days. Once they've made it, they will separate, perhaps never to meet again. It's the height of summer, and Lynn Rogers takes off for the backcountry. The forest is now a rich mosaic of many shades of green. Out across these three million acres, about 2,000 black bears are making their living. This wilderness of woods and water takes long and patient searching. Riding along by canoe is the best way to observe other local wildlife. Rogers and Wilker check for a signal from one of their radio collared bears and catch a glimpse of a moose bringing her calf down to the water for a drink.
A loon is temporarily frightened off its nest. With an air of nonchalance, it begins circling, careful not to reveal the location of its eggs. Greg Wilker has located a bear. In order to learn why it comes here and how it uses this part of the forest, he will follow it for a full 24 hours. He brings no food for himself which could distract the bear and meticulously records everything it does and everything it eats. Black bears may occasionally kill a fawn or a moose calf, but most of the animal fat and protein in their diets comes from insects. They have always sought out ants nests, but Rogers has discovered that it's the pupae, not the adult ants, the bears are after. The ants are protected with formic acid, but their nests are easily plundered by strong, curved claws. The bear's powerful sense of smell helps it locate food wherever it's stored. Tender aspen leaves are a favorite food in spring, but when the leaves mature, the bears can't eat them. Like humans, they have a hard time digesting cellulose. But it's worth checking the aspen anyway. It may be hiding tent caterpillars. Bears have an infamous reputation as carnivores, but their favorite prey is berries. When the berries ripen in July, the bears finally begin to put on the fat they'll need for winter hibernation. They even graze on grass and clover. One of the tasks of a mother bear is to teach her cubs which plants are good to eat. The cubs will remember specific places she has taken them for certain delicacies and return to them later on their own. Rogers checks in at the North Central Forest Experiment Station, where one of his assistants analyzes droppings to see what the bears have been eating. Her findings? Berries. Blueberries, raspberries, and June berries. All plants that need an opening in the forest to grow. Black bears require forests that are diverse. The reason the U.S. Forest Service wants information about bears and other wildlife is that they want to know how to manage the forest, not only to produce timber, but to benefit wildlife in the process. Our research bears are showing us that their most important foods come from forest openings. Removing some of the fast-growing aspen trees can let sunlight down to the forest floor and stimulate berry production for bears.
Excessive harvesting, of course, can open up too much of the forest. The purpose of our research is to find out how bears and people can use the forest together and better coexist. People are moving into bear country in ever greater numbers. As the people and homes increase, so do their effects on the forest. Bears like the same food as people, and when natural forage is hard to come by, they're drawn to the easy pickings of the local garbage dump. Farms, roads, and suburbs continue to fragment the bear's range. As young males wander in search of new territory, they can easily find themselves in suburban neighborhoods. In the entire United States, no one has ever been attacked by a black bear at a dump site. They move placidly through the human commotion quietly going about their own business. As the number of bear and human encounters multiplies, it's the bears that are most likely to get hurt. Black bears are one of the most popular big game animals in North America. In Minnesota, the bear hunting season lasts about seven weeks. But hunting is structured with the biology of bears in mind, and the population is thriving. Few bears, however, die natural deaths. In fact, 90% of adult bears are killed by people. Poaching and loss of habitat are the real threats to black bear populations. comes to the northern woods, and all its wild creatures get ready for the coming winter. In early October, Terry and her two cubs are already feeling the drowsy beginnings of hibernation. Since the end of August, their food supply from the forest has been dwindling, and their metabolism has been slowing down. of the afternoon sun, they can barely stay awake. Too sleepy even for last minute foraging. Rogers checks on their condition. I take their heart rate every day in fall as they change from their summer rate of 100 to 140 beats per minute to their winter rate of only 8 to 22 beats per minute.
Today the rate is 47. They're well on their way to hibernation. Tara usually lets me be part of the family, but today she seems a little nervous. Maybe it's all the attention from the cameras. Rogers responds by remaining calm, and Terry settles down again with the cubs. She selected a den for the family, and despite her declining energy, she has work to do to prepare it for winter. Black bears use a different den every year and will avoid one that another bear occupied the year before. The den is inspected carefully and cleaned out to make it ready for fresh bedding. The site must hold no lingering odors of bear that could attract wolves or dogs. Early humans often sought out winter dens and killed bears as they slept. Changing dens each year may make the bear harder to find. Resident birds, like the pileated woodpecker and the gray jay, will overwinter in these woods. Terry appears satisfied that the den is secure and begins to gather leaves to line the inside of the little cave. One of the cubs pitches in, helpfully raking up a few leaves. Content to let the rest of the family do the work, this little bear has all he can do just to stay sitting up. At last, all is ready, and Terry slowly retreats into the den. Her busy cub grabs one more twig for good measure and is quick to follow her. Even the second cub, plump with winter fat, finally rouses himself to go to bed and gathers a few pawfuls of leaves to hide the entrance to the den.
Winter settles into the woods, and as other wildlife work for their living, the bears go off to sleep. Rogers will be back to greet the emerging bears. I'm grateful for another year of learning how black bears live and what they need. Each year is different. For me, black bears are what make the woods come alive. As more people move into bear country, Bear survival will depend more and more on human tolerance. We're learning how tolerant black bears are of people. They certainly deserve our respect and the room to live. Next week on Nature, we'll investigate the threat to a marvelous mammal of the Amazon. Be with us next Sunday at 7 and meet the giant otters. And stay tuned now as the American Experience tells the story of the world-famous amusement park that blazed the trail for the theme parks of today. Coney Island is next, here on 11.